When Aragorn died, he was 210 years of age, living almost three times the life of an average man. But did you know that Aragorn was relatively short-lived compared to his ancestors? From the lofty heights of living over 400 years, by the end of the Third Age, a Dúnedain was lucky to pass 100 with any sort of vigour. So why did this happen? Why did the Dúnedain lifespan decrease so drastically? Find out in this video. At the end of the First Age, the remaining Adain were blessed by Aonwe, Herald of Manwe, for their efforts in the war against Morgoth. This blessing came with a host of benefits, increased stature and strength, increased wisdom and intelligence, increased skill and craft, but perhaps the most well-known blessing was their increased lifespan. Elros Tar Minyatur, first king of Numenor, lived for 500 years, and for the next 2000 years, his direct descendants usually lived for over 350 years, sometimes 400. As for regular Numenorians, sources differ. Some say they lived for around 200 to 250 years, but others say they could still live to over 300. But this would not last, thanks to the hubris of the Numenorians. With the reign of Tar Atanamir, which began in 2029, the Numenorians would begin to oppose the Vala, and their approach to Middle-earth would become more exploitative, and then eventually tyrannical. Tar Atanamir would live until the age of 421, but this would be the peak, and from that point, the Numenorian lifespan would begin to decline. By the time of Numenor's downfall, Numenorians belonging to the royal family would barely pass 200, and some of them, quite alarmingly, fell short of it. The reason for this is well stated. Due to the rebellion of the Numenorians, the Vala began to withdraw their blessing. This obviously affected the Numenorian lifespan, but it also affected their physiology in other ways. Once incredibly resistant to physical and mental illnesses, the Numenorians began to succumb to both in greater numbers. Ironically, as the Numenorian Empire reached the peak of its strength, individual Numenorians were at their weakest. However, this doesn't seem to have affected all Numenorians. Notably, the faithful, those Numenorians who did not oppose the Vala, seem to have retained their longer lifespan. While never explicitly stated by Tolkien, we know that Amundil, the last Lord of Andunier, was around the age of 300 when he sailed west in an attempt to plea before the Vala. Further evidence for this is Elendil. He was actually born only one year after Atharazon, Numenor's last king, but whereas Atharazon could feel his end approaching age 201, Elendil had no such problem, and would live for over another 120 years before being killed fighting Sauron. So if the faithful were seemingly spared from a decreasing lifespan, why did their descendants in Gondor and Arnor experience this? Elendil would reach 322 before being killed, clearly quite still physically capable if he could be one half of taking down Sauron. Both his sons would be slain, but his grandsons, Maneldil and Valandil, would reach 281 and 260 respectively. And with every following generation, that lifespan would continue to decrease. The last kings of both Arnor and Gondor to die of old age both fell well short of 200. And as I said earlier, with the exception of the chieftains of the Dúnedain in the north, even the most pure-blooded of Numenorean descendants were lucky to pass 100 by the end of the Third Age. This wasn't a punishment from the Valar though, and was in fact due to the legacy of their greatest enemy, Morgoth. I've spoken about this in other videos, the concept of Arda Mard, which is permanent damage to Arda caused by Morgoth dispersing his own dark power into the world. The only place that was immune to this, protected by the power of the Valar, was Valinor, and before it was destroyed, Numenor. The consequences of Arda Mard is that magic was slowly fading from Middle-earth. Everything was becoming more mundane over time. This mainly affected elves and dwarves, but it also affected the Dúnedain. Now no longer living in Numenor, they were no longer protected from Arda Mard. Their magically enhanced lifespan was now at the mercy of the decay that affected everything else in Middle-earth. So unfortunately for the Dúnedain, this wasn't a process they could reverse. It was almost inevitable that every successive generation would live a shorter lifespan than the previous one. I say almost because there were some exceptions, but I'll get to them later. But there were factors other than Arda Mard which affected the lifespans of the Dúnedain. Some would have positive effects, some negative, some were biological in nature, and others were more or less due to magical factors. Perhaps the most well-known factor that would affect the lifespan of a Dúnedain 
was their ancestry, whether they were pure Numenorean or whether they were mixed. Pure Numenoreans tended to retain their lifespans for much longer, whereas those that mixed would only accelerate the decline of their gifts. While this is pseudoscience in our own world, in Middle-earth it was a very real thing. If the Dúnedain mixed with lesser men, they would dilute the blood of their descendants, which in turn would accelerate the decline of their lifespans. This didn't necessarily happen in just one generation. After all, King Eldakar of Gondor was half Northman, but lived a lifespan comparable to his father. But successive generations of mixing would have a noticeable effect, and the Gondorians, for example, were wary of this. In fact, the Kinstrife Civil War was due, at least partially anyway, to Eldakar's mixed ancestry, and after his reign, as a precaution, those of the line of Anarion who took non-Numenorean partners were disqualified from the line of succession. To the south, in black Numenorean held lands, this mixing was much more common, and as a result, most of the vast black Numenorean holdings quickly lost power and influence and were overthrown by their subjects. But as I said earlier, there seems to be some magical factors at play as well. Whilst never explicitly stated by Tolkien, there is evidence that suggests that one's lifespan could be affected by the state of the realm, how close their own bloodline was to the king, and whether they achieved great deeds during their life and were rewarded for it. I'll start with the first one, the state of the realm, and how much shadow had fallen upon it. Earlier, I mentioned Maneldil, king of Gondor and son of Anarion, and Valandil, king of Arnor and son of Isildur. They lived to 281 and 260. There's a rather noticeable gap of 21 years there, and this isn't a coincidence. Kemendur, the next king of Gondor, lived to be 280. Eldakar, the next king of Arnor, 252. And this trend continues, with the kings of Gondor always living longer than their northern counterparts, sometimes in excess of 30 years longer. There's nothing that suggests that the bloodline of Isildur was weaker than the bloodline of Anarion, which leaves only one reasonable explanation. It had something to do with the prosperity of their respective kingdoms. This reflects the wildly different paths both kingdoms took early in the Third Age. Gondor was always the stronger kingdom, with a much larger population of pure Numenorians, and they grew powerful and dominated for much of the Third Age. Therefore, the kings ruled and lived longer. On the other hand, Arnor was always weaker, its population of Numenorians was much smaller, they relied on lesser men a lot more, the kingdom quickly divided and fell into civil war and eventually perished at the hands of Angmar. Therefore the kings ruled and lived shorter. It's almost as if Arda Mard accelerated in lands that were prone to more evil, or were less worthy of the mantle of the ancient kings of Numenor. Interestingly, we can also see something similar with the line of stewards, one of the purest remaining Numenorean lines in Gondor. From Mardil, the first ruling steward, to Belek IV the second, 21st ruling steward, the lifespans of the stewards bounced around a lot. Hador, the seventh steward, managed 150. He's a bit of an outlier, and he was the last man in Gondor to reach that age. Whereas Icfelion the first, 17th ruling steward, managed just 98. He was also a bit of an outlier and was the only steward in that range to fail to reach 100. I actually did the maths too. The average age for these stewards, minus Boromir who died from complications of a morgul wound, was 116. But during the reign of Belek IV II, the third white tree of Gondor died, and while Belek IV would hit 120, none of his descendants, of which there were four before Denethor II, would even pass 100. Another interesting fact is that the princes of Dol Amroth, much further from the shadow of Mordor, maintained their longevity for longer. With the exception of Adrahil, the father of Prince Imrahil, no prince of Dol Amroth who died of natural causes fell short of 100. Another factor I mentioned is how close one was to the direct line of kings. The blood of kings has power, and it seemed that the further a family member was from the king, the lower their lifespan was. We actually have two good examples of this. The first one is King Aenil II, the victorious general who led Gondor to victory during the Wainrider Wars. Now, in normal circumstances, Aenil would have never been king. He was the great-great-grandson of King Tulumatar Umbardakil, so he was a fairly distant cousin to King Onderher. But Onderher and his two sons were killed in battle, and although it's never stated that Aenil was the closest male heir, he was the most popular after his victory. 
but he only lived to be 160, 40 years less than Kalimatar, the father of Ondaher. A second example actually goes back to Numenor, and that's the husband of Tar and Calame, a man called Halakar. Halakar was of the line of Elros, his great 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 grandfather was Vardamir Nolimon, the second king of Numenor, making Tar and Calame his distant cousin. But whereas Tar and Calame lived to be 412, Halakar died at 359, dying a full 74 years before his wife. Now Halakar didn't die young, 350 plus was normal for the line of Elros, but up until their lifespan started declining, the kings and queens of Numenor always managed to reach 400, or at least just shy of it. This once again shows that although you may share the same bloodline, being removed from the direct line of rulers would have an effect on your lifespan. In both of these cases, I would like to point out that both Aonil and Halakar would have been full-blooded Numenorians. As I said earlier, taking a partner of non-Numenorian origin disqualified one from the line of succession. So for Aonil to have been elected king of Gondor, Siriondil, Kalimakil, and Arkyrias, Aonil II's ancestors who were descended from Tulumatar, must have taken Numenorian wives. And in the case of Halakar, Numenor was isolated at this point, so his father Halatan couldn't have taken a non-Numenorian wife. The lifespans of the chieftains of the Dúnedain might also show the importance of maintaining a kingly bloodline. Even though Arnor was destroyed, the chieftain succeeded in keeping a direct line from father to son over the next thousand years, and unlike the bloodline of Anarion, which was dispersed and no longer maintained a direct line, the line of Isildur maintained an extended lifespan. Aranath, the first chieftain, lived to be 168, and the last chieftain to die of natural causes, Arganui, lived to be 155, a decrease of only 13 years across 13 generations. The last factor that might affect the lifespan of Adunadan is deeds that might earn them divine favour. This isn't simply being a great king, after all, there were many fantastic Gondorian kings and stewards who did not earn themselves extended life. Rather, it would be extraordinary achievements during extraordinary times. Aragorn and Faramir are examples of this, two characters who played important roles in Sauron's defeat. Aragorn lived to be 210, whereas he might have been expected to die at around 150. Faramir lived to be 120, whereas he might have been expected to die before the age of 100. Elendil might have also been given this blessing. While we established earlier that the Lords of Andunie maintain their extended lifespans, unlike the Kings of Numenor, Elendil's might have been extended further for his role in the final days of Numenor and his establishment of the realms in exile. However, we will never know for certain, as Elendil was killed fighting Sauron. So, as you can see, the lifespans of the Dúnedain were at the mercy of a number of different factors. Although they almost always trended downwards, thanks to Arda Mad, this decline could be slowed or accelerated thanks to conditions such as the state of the realm, the lengthening of the shadow over said realm, the bloodline of the individual, and how close they were to the direct line of kings. And if you were lucky, or perhaps unlucky enough to be alive during extraordinary times, you could perhaps secure an extended lifespan depending on your deeds. Or you could cheat and take a ring of power from Sauron and live forever and everything will be great and awesome for you. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it or at least found it interesting. The ever-changing lifespans of the Numenorians and the Dúnedain are one of my favourite parts of Tolkien's lore, which is amazing because normally I hate anything to do with maths. Anyway, cheers, farewell, and remember, if you want to live an extended lifespan, don't drink, don't smoke, only eat healthy foods, never leave the house, don't trust anyone because they might murder you, especially doctors, become proficient at alchemy so you can discover the elixir of immortality, brew it in your bathtub, and then drink it.